My name is Jillian Michaels, and this is my course on how to lose weight and keep it off. I'm really excited to share, honestly, what is decades of collective knowledge. Being able to play a role, no matter how small, in somebody's journey towards being healthier and being happier is my purpose. At this point, it's not a secret that I was overweight as a kid. I struggled with weight my entire childhood. For a host of reasons, I've come to learn in my older age, as science has advanced, that I actually have four genetic markers for obesity. But on top of that, not only was I genetically predisposed, I was psychologically predisposed. My dad was also overweight and food was one of the ways that we bonded. We had a estranged relationship, but when we would go to the chicken shawarma place that we both liked, there was common ground, right? It provided me a connection with my father. As I got older, my grandmother died, my parents got divorced. I would turn to food after school as something to look forward to. Comfort, control. And I wasn't a popular kid in school at all. I was the loser kid. I was the fat kid with acne and nose on my face the size of a softball, crooked teeth, gay, didn't know I was gay, but somehow all the other kids had figured it out. And honestly, it was hell. And food was a refuge for me. It filled a deeper psychological need. And when I was about 13, my mom decided to intervene. Not with my weight, but with my headspace. And she got me into martial arts as a means to empower me, to give me a community, to help me feel stronger physically in the hopes that it would transcend into the other aspects of my life. And you know what? It did. And I'll tell you about the exact moment, right? So at this point, I'm now 14 and I've passed my yellow belt and I've passed my first degree blue belt and I've been doing martial arts for almost a year. I've got my second degree blue belt and I have to break these two boards with a sidekick for my test. And I was dreading it for months. I was like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do this. I'm gonna embarrass myself in front of everyone. I'm not gonna pass this test. And the long and the short of it is, I did it. I did the work. I prepared for it, I trained for it, and I did break those two boards. And I walked into school the next day just praying somebody would say something crappy to me. I was like, oh my God, please, please start something with me today. And you know what? Nobody did. I couldn't figure it out. And they didn't the next day or the next day or ever again. And the reason was because of how I carried myself because I respected myself, because I believed in myself and I felt I was worth it. And I wasn't that vulnerable fat kid that they felt would be easy to bully. My point here to this long story is that this didn't start because I wanted to lose weight. It started because I was lost in my life and fitness gave me a purpose. It gave me a deeper meaning. It's transcendent. And from there, I went on to lose the weight over time. At the time I was 17, I was training for my black belt. It had been almost five years. I had lost the weight. I did have my nose fixed. I did get my braces off. My skin had cleared up. And all of a sudden, I'm working out at the gym and people started coming up to me asking me you know, how much I charged. And I was like, charge for, for what? And they just assumed I was a fitness trainer. And I thought, well, this will make me a hell of a lot more money than delivering pizzas for $5 an hour. And yes, that is actually what I was doing at 17. Uh, so my mom, again, had the foresight to get me a little weekend certification in personal training. And to be honest with you, it all started there very organically, very unintelligently. And I took it for granted for years. I was like, I make great money. I love what I do. I go to the gym and I like my clients and I help them get fit and it feels really good. Now I'm 24. Okay. And I decide, I start dating somebody who works in the entertainment industry, went to an Ivy League college and begins to pressure me that I need a real job. So the long and the short of it is I get a desk job 
And I do this desk job for three years and I've never made less money in my life and I've never been more miserable. And it happened to be at an entertainment agency, an agency that represents writers and actors, directors. So the long and the short of it is I end up getting fired at 27 from this job and I'm like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna pay my bills, right? I have scraping change up out of the couch to put gas in my car to go to job interviews. So I fall back into physical, physical fitness and I begin working at a sports medicine facility, but as a physical therapy aid. So I'm putting towels on, cold towels on people and, you know, doing electric muscle stimulation and following the instruction of physical therapists. And to be honest, I was depressed. I felt I had wasted three years of my life. I thought I had failed until one day I kind of transitioned back into taking these physical therapy patients back into fitness training after they'd kind of graduated from rehab. I'm still taking it for granted, but I'm not miserable. I haven't really taken note of it, but one day I get a call from my client. Her name was Karen and I'll never forget it. And she felt her hip bone for the first time in eight years because she'd lost so much weight and she was in tears. And in that moment, now I'm in tears. I call my mom, I'm like, Karen just felt her hip bone. And my mom's like, oh my God, who's Karen? <laughs> and then the, and the, the point is, I realized in that moment this is what I was always meant to do. This is what brings me joy. It's what brings me purpose. It's what comes to me organically. And the reason why is because I take all of the things I do that empower me, everything I know, I actually don't know for you. I know for me. I know because I learned it for me. I wanted to lose weight. I wanted to be stronger. I want to live longer, right? I want all these things for me. So I do the homework and then I share it. And I'm really lucky to make a living doing what I genuinely love to do. But there's one more layer to this. So I get to be healthy and I get to make money being healthy, which is great. But Freud, we're gonna go down this rabbit hole, so hold on, said that we have two buckets of meaning in our life, right? Our relationships, the love in our life, and our work. And for me, being able to play a role in somebody's journey towards living a healthier and happier life gives me that purpose. In a world where I feel helpless 99.9% .9 of the time, especially parenting, by the way, this work makes me feel like I'm actually able to make a difference. So I just want to say thank you for watching the video and thank you for considering allowing me to be a part of your journey. It's one of the greatest honors of my entire life and one of my greatest joys. Diet culture has been rife with bullshit since inception. Why? Because it's a business and sexy promises always sell. From magic bullet drugs to absurd fad diets, the downpour of lies and conflicting information seems to know no end. But we're beyond keto versus the Mediterranean diet now, guys. The narratives with weight loss culture have gotten so much more nefarious. So I want to look at each and then discuss why. Now, all the thought leaders are going to tell you it's really complicated. It's multifactorial. And all the thought leaders and all the king's men can't seem to solve the problem. Why? Because everything outside of you that contributes to the problem is going to be impossible to change. Effectuating change on a macro level, I mean, it's impossible. It really is. We aren't making healthy food cheaper, right? We're not going to get more parks and urban neighborhoods for kids to play in. We aren't getting big food to make their products better for you and on and on and on, right? But if it's so complicated and they can't fix it, how can you? Well, the media, they tell you it's fine, right? Don't worry. You're big and you're beautiful. Like, you go, girl. And they virtue signal for popularity, not because it's true, when you're scared of the health issues and you're feeling the impact on your quality of life, it sounds nice to hear though, right? Like, don't worry, you can be healthy at any size. Now, buy whatever we're selling you. 
The pharma companies and many in the medical community are now going to tell you it's genetic. It's a disease of the brain that results in an insatiable hunger. And they do this because it's profitable. So if there's no solution that you can implement, then you need their solution, which would be bariatric surgeries, weight loss drugs, maybe even a combo of the two. So let's address these one by one, okay? Number one, you're not healthy at any size, okay? We know this for sure. Optimal health, longevity, and quality of life all go hand in hand with a body that just doesn't have excess visceral fat between your organs, in your organs. This is a lie, guys. Obesity contributes to 170 comorbidities from erectile dysfunction to heart disease and cancer. And if you think you don't have the big three, which would be heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, there are a ton of other things going on in your body that aren't good. We know that when we're overweight and we have excess fat, it messes up our microbiome. It can cause vitamin D deficiency. It can increase the release of inflammatory proteins, blah, 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 blah. There is a healthier, happier way forward. And you know it or you wouldn't be watching this video, okay? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Well, health is quantifiable, but it's critical that you are positive about your body and you do know your worth because only from this headspace can you be successful with any journey of self-improvement, all right? So case in point, I work out because I love my body, not because I hate it. And I'm here to tell you, weight loss isn't complex, it's simple. You need to eat less food, period, okay? While there are many things that work against us doing that, Ultimately, the buck stops with you. You can say no. Walking is free, along with literally dozens of other forms of exercise. It costs less not to have the 500 calorie Frappuccino. So while getting all these outside factors to change is complicated, yeah, you can opt out of them. This is not a complex matter. It's basic math of calories in and calories out, which I'm gonna to get to later, along with common sense choices. Now, while it is simple, I didn't say it was easy. Over this course, I'm gonna teach you where the physiological and the psychological hunger is coming from, and most importantly, how to cope with it. Speaking of hunger, how about the narrative that obesity is a disease? What, what kind of disease? It's a disease of the brain where you can't recognize fullness. I'm not saying this. This is the narrative, right? And then of course, there's the genetics narrative. You're obese because of your genetics. And by the way, little sidebar, I have four genetic markers for obesity. And I'm not obese. And where was this disease 50 years ago? Prior to 1970, I think roughly 5% of American adults were labeled as overweight or obese. Now, just 55 years later, it's 75%. I mean, that's a hell of a quantum leap for genetics, no? Obesity is not a medical disease. It results in medical diseases, many of them. But obesity is an adaptation, period. And in fact, back in 2013, the American Medical Association voted on whether or not to label obesity as a disease. Before they did, however, they put together a panel of experts, their own experts, to help with the determination, right? Is it, is it not? So the panel actually voted no. They voted no, obesity is not a medical disease. They said specifically it's an adaptation to an environment that promotes a sedentary lifestyle where we are surrounded with an abundance of calorie dense foods. But guess what? They voted that it was a disease anyway. Why? So they could bill insurance. They wanna bill insurance companies for obesity related treatments, which by the way, I'm not opposed to. But the reason this narrative is dangerous is because it disempowers people. So if it's a disease, then you're gonna need medication for it, right? If you have a disease, surely you can't fix it yourself. You're broken. You need outside intervention. And here we are, face-to-face -face with the latest trend 
to treat obesity with new drugs, satiety hormone agonists. You've heard of them, but I'll run down the list. Ozempic, Wagovi, Monjaro, Ribelsis, and the list goes on and it's growing with drug companies clamoring to get into the game. Now I'm betting you know someone who's taken one of these drugs and lost a lot of weight, right? It's, it's tempting, so why shouldn't you do it? And no, it isn't because it's an easy way out. I sure wish it was. If it was, I would sell it through my fitness app like many of the other fitness apps are doing. I would take it myself. I mean, willpower be damned. We're gonna talk about willpower later, by the way. So why not do it? Now, I wanna back into this with our best case scenario instead of the scary warning on the back of the cigarette box that people go numb to, right? Just tune that out. So first, here's the thing. You're gonna plateau on these drugs. Every single study has shown us that somewhere between weeks 68 and 72, the drugs stop working. You stop losing weight on them, which is why the drug companies are working on drugs that are double agonists or even King Kong triple agonists, meaning they work to mimic multiple hunger hormones. But at some point, those will plateau as well. The same mechanism that makes you plateau to the first one is gonna make you plateau with all three. Second, 50% of the people who go on these drugs experience side effects. Some are relatively benign when you put them in perspective, so significant loss of muscle and bone density, nausea, vomiting, constipation, bloating, but the more severe side effects are vision problems, thyroid cancer, kidney failure, gallbladder issues, pancreatitis, stomach paralysis, <sighs> intestinal blockage. Not kidding. And third, you can never get off of these drugs. All the meta-analysis show us that the people who get off the drugs gain two thirds of the weight back, I think in the first year alone, and then eventually rebound with a vengeance, putting on more weight than they started with. Plus, we really have no idea what a lifetime of being on these drugs will look like. I mean, will the aforementioned side effects be inevitable over time? I mean, let me guess, you're thinking, but Jill, obesity is just as deadly over time. You just said so. I did, that's true, but here's the clincher, guys. You can lose the weight, and you can keep it off. And the only side effects you have will be upside. I can teach you how, and I'm going to. You know how these drugs work? And a secret for you, ready? They make you eat less. Pause, pause for effect. That's it. There's no other magic. They mimic a satiety hormone called GLP-1 that curbs hunger. So here is the great news, are you ready? Weight loss drugs have two massive positives. They illustrate that calories in versus calories out facilitates weight loss. I have been vindicated decades of saying this and I am finally vindicated. And they prove that you can lose weight at any age by simply eating less. Menopause, PCOS, hypothyroidism, these are not insurmountable issues, it's all doable. So it is time for us to wipe the slate clean here, guys. I want you to forget all the nonsense that you've been fed, literally and figuratively, all the Instagram and TikTok rhetoric, the fad diet insanity, the narratives from big food and big pharma. Empty your brain of anything you have ever heard because it is largely bullshit and in the remainder of this course, I'm gonna teach you exactly what's true and what isn't. What is body fat? How does it build up in your body? What types are bad and what types are good? What's a calorie? How do you know how many to eat daily? How do you know how many you're burning daily? What role do genetics play and how do you make what is predisposed not be predetermined? Or what about food quality? Do macros count and should you be counting them? How do you overcome hormonal imbalances like PCOS, type two diabetes, and hypothyroidism to lose weight? Why does your hunger feel insatiable and how can you get control of it? Do you need to work out? Yes. If so, 
what type of exercise is best, how much, how often. Don't worry about any of this. Don't be intimidated. I'm going to teach you everything. And in a way, that's really easy to understand. I'm going to take all the guesswork out and tell you exactly what's up and what to do. So the days of feeling confused, overwhelmed, and defeated are over. Welcome to my no-nonsense course on losing weight.